Eric Metaxas and Pastor Alan Jackson of World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, joined me recently for a panel conversation after a screening of the 1916 Project at World Outreach Church. Guys, this was incredible. This was our biggest screening yet. We had 3,500 people 3,500 people in August at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The sanctuary was packed. They had overflow seating to watch the live stream conversation. It was one of the highest energy events we've ever been to. And my good friend, Eric Metaxas, who's featured in the 1916 Project, joined me and Pastor Alan Jackson, one of the bravest pastors in America I know, for a broad conversation, a, a wide ranging conversation on the unborn child, the family, the Democrat party, this election, the agenda, where things go if the church doesn't stand soon. It was such a powerful conversation. We wanted to bring it to you today on the Seth Gruber Show to encourage you, to show you what God's doing through this film around the country, through these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of screenings we're doing, and give you your rallying cry, some courage and some encouragement for you, your family, your church. Guys, share this. This was one of the most powerful conversations I've ever had with my friend, Eric Metaxas, Pastor Alan Jackson hosted this screening at his church, World Outreach Church. We get into all of it today. Buckle up, you're in for a treat. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is The Seth Gruber Show. So you, um, there's no way to produce something with that message without there being a spiritual pushback. You have, I don't, you haven't told me that, but I, I know the, I know the arena well enough to know that. Right. Yeah, I, uh, I have the honor of being on the road about nine days a month, and I'm actually, I'm trying to cut that in half next year. I'm actually raising up like some warrior, barn burner, pro-life, culture war, Gideon, spirit-filled men speakers at my ministry so that when, when you want me at your church, and then I show you my picture of my three kids, and my wife says, if you take that speaking gig, I'm going to leave you, then I can send another young man to go speak. So, but the point is this, like, um, being on the road so much, you know, I, I leave a lot, I come back, two night trips, one night trips, one pulpit, come right home. And there's not usually a ton of, like, attack on my family um, or just various things going absolutely crazy. But every time that, that we left to film, which, I mean, I didn't take that many trips. I went to Munich, I went to Nashville, I went to Raleigh, New York City, and then the Jack Hibbs and the Nancy Piercy interview, I wasn't even there. So it wasn't even that many trips. But if I left home to go film, everything hit the fan. It was super intense. And because most of my trips was not filmed. Most of my trips was, is preaching in pulpits. And... So I'll just, I just want to share one thing with you guys, because I, I want you, to, I hope you capture how powerful the film is, but I also want you to understand like how much the enemy didn't want this entire project to be made, actually. And so one, one little vignette. Um, so we left from Munich in, in early December. And uh, of course, the second I get to Atlanta for the nonstop to Munich, the Munich airport shuts down because of frozen fog. I've never even heard of that. I grew up in LA. Is that a thing in the Nashville? I don't know. Frozen fog. So the Munich airport shut down. And so then I had to go to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Frankfurt, four hour train ride through the night from Frankfurt to Munich. And the entire 10 hours that, that we were gonna have to rest there before filming because of the time change, that was gone. Train's full. My entire video team is, is sitting on their butts in, the, in, the, in that area between two trains that you walk between. And I'm like, what is going on right now? Uh, my bag never gets to Munich. So all my nice clothes, you know, because I got to look good because I'm in my first movie. You know, none of that gets to Munich. Um, and, and so then I have to go to Hugo Boss and spend an exorbitant amount of money, like 30 minutes before filming, because I'm still in the underwear that I was on in the plane. I've got literally nothing. Everything's in the suitcase. So I have to go buy an entire new wardrobe. And I never got my suitcase for the whole trip. We were in Germany for four or five days. And then um, we go to start filming, and, uh, and my camera guys are on the sidewalk, and then an icicle falls off a building in Munich, hits a piece of metal, and comes four stories down and misses our camera guy's head by about like a few inches. And we're like, all right, time to start filming. 
And I was like, goodness gracious. Um, and, then, and then here was the thing that was really, it honestly like, it, it, it just, it felt so demonic. Um, you saw Sophie's graveside, right? Yeah. Sophie Scholl's graveside. And my, so my third child, Sophie Sunshine, who turns two in December, um, we filmed at, at her namesake, Sophie Scholl's graveside. Four or five hours later, I'm in the hotel room because of the time change and it's dark. And my wife FaceTimes me from the back of an ambulance. And I'm like, what's going on, babe? And our daughter, Sophie, had just had a seizure. Um, now, we think it turned out that it was probably a febrile seizure, um, but I, we didn't know what that was. I mean, her eyes rolled back, she turned purple. Um, my wife thought that she was losing our daughter. Thankfully, she was at our, her parents' house, my in-laws, but she came to and that she was like, you know, after a seizure, if you know anything, you're kind of not fully there yet. And, uh, I gotta tell you, in that moment, it was like, it just felt like the enemy was saying like, you continue to do this project and, and mm, maybe you'll be visiting your own Sophie's graveside. And so the attack behind the film, and that's just a little of the stories, has is, is, been like gnarly, so. Here we are, the film comes out the first week of October for the whole world, so. <laughs> By the way, I, I want to I honor our producer, David Kunrat. Why don't you stand up? This is the producer of the 1916 Project. And uh, guess, guess who his pastor is? Pastor Jack Hibbs. <laughs> so he's here tonight, and he'll be in the foyer to say hi. It's a spiritual battle, right? Absolutely. So you understand... It's a spiritual battle, but the Lord created us for this spiritual battle. If you're not Amen. in the spiritual battle somehow, you're missing it. Mm. Because the Lord created us for this spiritual battle. And he wants us all to fulfill his will by being in this spiritual battle. And I, and I, I sounded a little bit like Kamala Harris just then. Oh. I was repeating myself <laughs> too much. Uh, but you know, so it's a political battle. <laughs> Alan, your turn. <laughs> We've said it many times. We don't have a, a political problem. We have a spiritual problem. Amen. And the real, the, the struggle is not because of the depravity of the wicked. Mm. The struggle is because of the ambivalence of the faithful. That's good. We have to change, folks. We've got to stop looking through the windows of our churches and saying the problem is out there. Yeah. If the church is the church, we'll triumph over evil. That's right. That's right. Amen. But uh, you, you, you may, it may cost you a business deal. It will definitely cost you friendships. We're going to have to have a different attitude. That's right. We've been casual. Yeah. We've winked at wickedness. Yeah. We've tolerated it. We've left it in our friend circle. Yeah. And we will answer to Almighty God for that when the church fails. Human beings suffer. That's right. And children suffer disproportionately. Always. And we're at a tipping point. We, this is not a 10-year discussion. Yeah. I, I believe with all of my heart what happens in the immediate future. And I don't mean just the election. The election's not going to fix us. Yeah. If you think the first Wednesday of November is going to make the world a better place... I think we have an opportunity to vote and to make a difference and to make a statement, but we will need greater strength on Wednesday than we will need on Tuesday when we cast our ballots. Yep. It, I just want to be clear, just to, in, a, in a way to flip that or to say it in a, in a different way, 
um, the, if, if we defeat the leftist, um, the demonic left, because it's no longer, this is not the party of Michael Dukakis, this is not the party of Dick Gephardt and Tip O'Neill and Jimmy Carter, or even, even Bill Clinton. It has lurched leftward to a point now where it is, it's demonic. You see that. When you have an abortion clinic, a mobile unit, killing children just outside the convention, you understand that the evil is now blatant. It is, it is clear. So I think we want to be clear that if, if we do not defeat that in November, I'm, I'm here to tell you it is over. It is over. We will fight... If we win, by the grace of God, we don't deserve to win, but if we win the election, it will buy us the ability yeah. to fight the day after and the that's day it. after and the yeah, day after it. and the day after. But we have to win the election. Yeah. And so anytime anybody says that, well, it doesn't matter, Jesus is on his throne, L listen, let me tell you, you can say that, and that can be the voice of the devil. Because it, it, if you had an opportunity to fight Hitler in 1932 and you said, oh, the Lord's on his throne, why fight Hitler? Because the Lord has called you to fight evil. And just as he has called us to fight evil, so we are, we are to fight evil. So anybody foolish enough to think that electing, re-electing Donald Trump will solve our problems, it won't. But if we don't re-elect Donald Trump, we will not have the opportunity yeah. to do what God has called us yeah. to do. And that is very clear, very clear. So uh, when, I, when I met Eric, the first time, when the first time I met him at my, my pastor Rob McCoy's church um, in Godspeed Calvary Chapel, he was that pastor who took his tie off in 2020 and, and he, he spun it around and he said, the church is a strip club, so we're an essential business. <laughs> so we can, meet, we can meet at our church. So that's my pastor. Um, so anyways, the first time I met Eric at, at Pastor Rob McCoy's church, um, I, I pulled out my Bonhoeffer book, and I was kind of fanboying a little bit. He was probably like, this guy, he must have been homeschooled or something, weirdo. And because um, I wanted him to sign the book, but I didn't want to ask, you know. And so, and I, I said, I said, when I read your book at 20 years old, there was a line from Eberhard Betge, um, who was one of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's best friends and a member of the Confessing Church. And I said, I memorized that passage, and I've used it in the introductions to a lot of my pro-life talks ever since. And I said, it fundamentally changed how I viewed the entire culture war. And, and that remains just as true today. And here's, so here's what Betke said, who survived the Holocaust, and he later was like sort of a prophetic voice to the West, trying to teach them what Bonhoeffer's trying to teach them. And here's what he said. He said, Bonhoeffer introduced us in 1935 to the problem of what we today call political resistance. The levels of confession, and by confession he means proclamation, not confessing sins, but to proclaim. The levels of confession and resistance could no longer be kept neatly apart. The escalating persecution of the Jews generated an increasingly intolerable situation, especially for Bonhoeffer himself. We, the confessing church, we now realize that mere, mere confession, no matter how courageous, inescapably meant complicity with the murderers. Even though there would always be new acts of refusing to be co-opted, and even though we could preach the message of Christ alone Sunday after Sunday, during the whole time, the Nazi state never considered it necessary to prohibit our preaching. Why should it? Thus, we were approaching the borderline between confession and resistance. And if we did not cross this border soon, our confession would be no better than cooperation with the criminals. And so it became clear where the problem lay for the confessing church. We were resisting by way of confession. But we were not confessing by way of resistance. End quote. In other words, the only way that our resistance to the culture of death was manifesting itself was through words. And he said, none of this is going to stop until our confession, our proclamation, manifests itself through action-oriented resistance to the spirit of the age and his acolytes in the culture of death. And we are now on a similar sort of Rubicon line or knife's edge, if you will, right now. I am not joking around with you. This is not fun and games anymore. CPS is taking children from the homes of Americans who are gender-confused and if one or either parents are not affirming of their minor's gender delusion and a Faustian, Faustian, follow the science little communist determines that one or both parents is a mental health risk to their child through their non-gender affirming attitudes, then the state can take your kid. That bill has been signed in California, in the state of Washington, oh, and also by Tim Waltz. 
Kamala Harris's new VP mate. This legislation is now starting to sweep the nation. Those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. And those who murder the unborn will one day murder you too, the longer you tolerate the sacrament of Satan. So until Christians recognize that politicians are not coming to save us anytime soon, that Jesus Christ is not coming on Air Force One, that it will take a rebirth of Christian resistance at the local level, that none of this changes. G.K. Chesterton was one of the most articulate, vocal, and loud opponents to Sanger and her ilk and friends in eugenesis in the early 20th century. And he said something so prophetic, I have to share it with you today, because it's the solution out of all of this mess. Anyone disappointed by the GOP and the RNC? I am. Here's what Chesterton said. He said, the business of progressives is to keep on making mistakes. The business of conservatives is to prevent the mistakes being corrected. Even when the revolutionist might repent of his revolution, the traditionalist is already defending that as a part of his tradition. Thus, we have the two great types. The advanced person who rushes us into ruin, Kamala Harris, and the retrospective person who admires the ruins. Is that not an excellent description of the conservative movement in America, the Republican Party, and the weak, wimpy, woke Andy Stanleys and Rick Warrens who care more about being invited to Davos by Klaus Schwab than they do about standing for righteousness in pure and undefiled religion. Until the church realizes that we're gonna do a heck of a lot more than voting to get out of this mess, nothing will change. But first, thank you, Every Life Diaper Company, for supporting The Seth Gruber Show, for sponsoring this show. Guys, it's the Pro-Life Diaper Company. I tell you every week, but it's because they're so incredible. They're the fastest growing diaper company in America. So they're not just like, we're pro-life, give us your money. It's like, no, they're actually like business professionals, and they're a very fast-growing company. Everylife.com. Get your diapers and wipes from here. If you've got babies, if you've got loved ones with babies, if your church has a nursery, everyone that you know needs to get their diapers from every life. <laughs> because if we all take away our money from pro-abortion diaper companies and we give it to the pro-life baby companies, then we defund woke corporatism and start attacking the woke mind virus and rebuilding a culture of life through the marketplace. So go to everylife.com, promo code SETH10, SETH10, for 10% off your first order and let them know that we sent you because your support supports the Seth Gruber Show and it helps create a culture of life as we fight for a culture of life with our dollars and our wallets. Everylife.com, promo code SETH10. Thank you for sponsoring the Seth Gruber Show. So let's make the film go viral. <laughs> let's do it. Well, there was some point in the film that somebody mentioned the, uh, the men of Issachar. I don't remember that where that was in the film, but this is a big thing, and you see this among many Christians. Um, they they don't understand that the Lord is alive and speaking now. They kind of act like yes, He spoke, and we have the Word of God. And you're like, well, you know, the devil can quote the Word of God. You need to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. It needs to be informed by what is the Lord saying now. And that to me is the issue. You mentioned some of these pastors uh, and I have railed against them uh, and, you know, try to reach them with my book letter to the American church in the sense that you, you, you think that everything is the same as it always was. You, if it was 1985 and if Tip O'Neill is the face of the Democratic Party, well, then you've got a few years. <laughs> you can keep being winsome. But the point is, if you're in a war, yeah. If, you, if you know, in 1933, Bonhoeffer knew, he knew that the Lord was saying, church, now is the time to act, right now. And if you don't, if you don't, in two years, your ability to act will have ended. In other words, if you have some idea that, oh, oh, God's a gracious God and he'll give you a second chance and a third chance, well, that's sort of true, but, you know, have you ever missed a plane by a minute? No. It doesn't really matter if you miss it by an hour or a minute, it's gone. And when it's gone, it's gone. You can't say, well, I believe the Lord is gracious and uh, if I only missed it by a minute, well, no, you missed it. If we do not act now, like now, 
the window is closing. Bonhoeffer tried to get the church to see this in the early 30s. He knew that the window was closing, that there was an opportunity to act, and if the church would do what, what the Lord was asking it to do, they could save Germany and avert the nightmare that we all know they didn't avert. But they waited and waited and waited. They thought, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. The moment yeah. all, Hitler wanted the church to continue to be asleep, and, and that's what the devil wants, and that's what the devil wants in America. And there are many pastors in America right now who pretend that they don't need to be in this fight. Yep. They believe it, do it doesn't matter, everything's fine, everything's fine. The window is closing, and I promise you, uh, if, if Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz are elected, they are going to come after pastors and people of faith like you have never seen. And I say this as a warning, you need to fast and pray for this election. Fast and pray for this election and understand Amen. what is at stake because there will come a time when you will not have a voice, you will be shut down. That, that is coming to America. We, we've had enough taste of it to see what, what is going on. Parents yeah. have had their kids taken away. You just mentioned it because they were not affirming them. That has happened in America. What just happened in England, it, it's, it's chilling. But I believe the Lord is allowing this to wake up his church to understand that the, the window is closing. I, I really do believe we have almost no time to get this right. Yep. Yep, and then if you get political, they say you're not, you're not nice, you're not winsome. I'm reminded of something Spurgeon said. He said, bold-hearted men are always called mean-spirited by cowards. I will. Before you go to sleep, get on your knees. And tell the Lord you're sorry for what we've tolerated. Yeah. And give the Holy Spirit permission to show you any place in your life where you're accommodating ungodliness. Yeah. At your kitchen table, at your holiday table, in your peer group. Yeah. We have winked at wickedness. And it's made us blind to it when they drive the abortion van up in front of the DNC. Yeah. If we will get on our knees... Then we get the authority of Almighty God and heaven behind us. Yeah. That's where the change will come. It'll show up yeah. in November because your heart will be moved to participate and we'll get off our good intentions and stop hiding behind all of our spiritual jargon. Listen, the, here, here's, what, here's another thing people can do. If you're going to a church that is not in this war, if you attend a church that is not in this battle, in this war, if you're tithing to a church like that, I wanna beg you to get out of that church. That's I right. beg you, Amen. you have friends. Amen. I'm not, I mean, I'm not kidding. People, where, whenever we've screened the film Letter to the American Church, uh, or people have read my book or I speak, I, I get asked the same question, what do we do, what do we do? The first thing that I say every time is if you're going to a church, and I know tons of people listen to my radio program, yeah. or watch me on TBN, they're going to churches yep. that are not in this battle. And they go, oh, well, my pastor, he, pre he preaches, you know, the full counsel of scripture. You know what? The devil loves that. It's good. Keep preaching. Don't do anything. Just keep preaching. But don't live it out. Courage is a biblical value. If you're not living out your faith, if you're not in this battle, if you're going to a church where the shepherd is not leading you in this battle, when people say to me, Eric, what, what do we do? I say, please Please, for the sake of your soul, get out of that church. Take your tithe, take your friends. If you have friends going to churches yeah. that are not in this battle, recognize that those churches have been cursed the way Jesus cursed the fig tree. No fruit, you are cursed. You have not fulfilled your purpose. The church is supposed to be active. It's yeah. supposed to be motivated, moved by the Holy Spirit and in this battle. And because it's always very comforting to say like, oh, well, Seth Gruber's doing stuff or Alan Jackson's doing stuff. You know, when, when, when you tell us the story of demonic attack, we should all be demonically attacked. We should all be in the battle. And we know like I'm over the target. The enemy's not happy. 
Yeah. It shouldn't just be a, a few people. And so I beg you, brothers and sisters, if you're going to a church or you know people going to churches that are not in this battle for the sake of your soul, get out of those churches. I beg you. Yeah, amen. Um, I'll take a swing at that too. Um, so the, the reason I founded the White Rose Resistance was actually to kind of answer the question, what can we do? And <laughs> that's why I founded the ministry. Um, and so we're not just an educational media organization creating films and projects that we are. We're gonna do more of those. And education's power, right? Knowledge is power. And you see that, it's hard to remain unchanged. But we're also giving people sort of an avenue and a lane to jump in to do something. So we're actually establishing and launching White Rose Resistance chapters all around the country. Not in college campuses, uh, uh, though, I mean, hey, hey, I'm leaving that to Charlie Kirk, <laughs> okay? Like, I, I didn't feel led to do that. But, but believers, of all ages in the local community learning what Christian resistance looks like. So we've launched in Boise. We just launched in Southern California after our screening with um, Pastor Jack Hibbs and Dr. George Grant, who, by the way, lives in Franklin, Tennessee, and he wanted to come tonight, but he couldn't get out of a teaching obligation he had for the next generation because he raises up a lot of dragon slayers. So Dr. George Grant from Franklin, Tennessee wanted me to tell you hi and thank you for coming to this film because he's really an advisor over this whole project. Um, and so we're launching these chapters. We're we're launching in Denver next week, um, and then we're launching in Fort Worth, Texas in September, um, and then we're trying to launch in Florida before the end of the year, and then early next year, I would love to launch in Tennessee, in uh, Virginia, in Nevada, and in Arizona for starters. And so what we're doing is we actually do a weekend launch. We actually do a whole bunch of training for boots on the ground activism. And yes, I, just, I did just say that word in church. A lot of Christians have been really uncomfortable with the word activism. I don't know if it goes back to Operation Rescue and those heroes who were engaging in civil disobedience outside of abortion centers to save babies. I don't know what it is, but the church has been really uncomfortable with that word activism. It just means doing more than voting and engaging in your local sphere where God has given you influence. So I want to tell you one story about like this, you know, this powerful, important question of what can we do? Um, and it's it's a really little vignette, but it's a really important lesson. Last summer, last July, um, I got word from some friends that an all-trimester abortion center in Washington, D.C., it was called, the du it's called DuPont, it still operates there. They, they do abortions through point of birth. Actually, at that center, you get aromatherapy. Um, no, I'm, I'm not kidding. Massages, um, comfort, fitting, slippers. It's like how the rich Carthaginians would have killed their kids. So, because California had codified abortion through point of birth into the California state constitution, which now, by the way, has happened in Washington, Michigan, Kansas. Um, they're pushing it right now in Idaho and Colorado and Florida. Um, DuPont said, great time to expand. Let's open up an all-trimester murder mill in Beverly Hills. So we heard about this. So I called Pastor Jack Hibbs. He put my video out and we called some other pastors and we got 1,200 people outside the street in downtown Hollywood, Beverly Hills. We shut down half the street. It was like a mile from Rodeo Drive. We set up a stage. We, we repented. We worshiped. We prayed. We had speakers. I spoke. And then in the middle of the event, this is so good. This was last July. I tell this story in my book. The, one of our event organizers got an email from the lawyer representing the building owner saying that the building owner had just rescinded the lease to DuPont in the middle of our event, and they wouldn't be opening their all-trimester murder mill while we were praying the gates of hell down at the very building they were due to open next week. And, and we just started worshiping, and we just had this celebration. It was just this amazing moment. Now listen, the pessimist in me because I get jaded by the culture war. I mean, you know, it's exhausting. The pessimist in me wanted to go, well, California is still legal through all nine months of pregnancy. So, I mean, a woman who would have gone to the center could just go somewhere else and get a third trimester abortion. But that's not the takeaway from that lesson. The takeaway is what if the church in California had been showing up like that for the last 50 years? whenever there was wickedness planned or an agenda manifesting. Because when the church stands up, Satan sits down. And we know from abortion workers who have left the industry, because listen, you, you saw the I've been in this fight since I was a fetus. I've been swimming in these waters, literally, for a really long time. And so we see abortion workers leave the industry. And sometimes they come to pro-lifers and they say, hey, you know when you were doing that 40 Days for Life prayer campaign outside of my abortion center? 
well, now that I'm a Christian and I, I've left the industry, I just want to tell you pro-lifers now that your 40 days of sidewalk counseling and prayer, we would see a 50 to 75% no-show for abortion appointments that were already scheduled. And we have been told that story for years and years. So to the sweet lady warrior who said, what can we do? Can you imagine if Christians showed up outside of abortion centers every day they were open with 100 people, 200 people, pleading for the life of the orphan and promising the help and love of the local church to that mom? Can you imagine how many babies would be saved? We would begin to bankrupt the abortion industry. Now, I understand in Tennessee, it's, it's illegal, and so the abortion pill is being shipped into your state which last year resulted in 63% of the abortions. Last year, 630,000 of the babies that were aborted were aborted by a Nazi-era-esque abortion pill. And by the way, the reason for that is RU486 is Roussel Uclof, the French pharmaceutical company that created the abortion pill. But Roussel Uclof has a majority shareholder named Hooks AG. And in 1916, something about that year, Hooks AG co-founded another German chemical company known as IG Farben. And IG Farben became infamous for the creation of a cyanide gas known as Zyklon B the gas used to poison Jews in Nazi death camps. So Hooks AG simply shifted from creating poison to murder Jews to creating poison to murder babies. It's the same company. So just so you understand the importance of knowing how we got here. So what do we do? Well, what we're doing at the White Rose Resistance is we're launching chapters. We're getting people to support us. Then we're training. Someone in this room, God might ask to apply to be a regional coordinator of a Tennessee White Rose Resistance chapter when we launch in Tennessee next year, maybe. And then you'll start mobilizing believers to do prayer and worship events outside of abortion centers, trained in sidewalk counseling to plead for the baby. I'll train you to speak at school board meetings in 90-second talks to expose the Kinsey pornographic, obscene sex ed that Planned Parenthood helped architect and make you a viral social media barn burner Christian nationalist speaker who primaries every single one of those demonic school board members and replaces them with one, a man and woman filled, filled with the spirit of God and getting Christianed onto local school boards. Those, that's just some of the stuff we're going to be doing at the White Rose Resistance as we're launching our chapters. Wow, what a powerful, powerful, powerful conversation. Thank you guys for tuning into this conversation today with me and Eric Metaxas and Pastor Alan Jackson. Share this, okay? This is on my YouTube channel, this is on Rumble, or this is on all the audio podcast apps and platforms. Go share this, send this to a friend who will buy the book and screen the film, The 1916 Project, at their church before it comes out leading up to the election. If you wanna join the White Rose Resistance to help us create more films like this, awakening the church and helping us launch our resistance chapters around the country. Go to thewhiterose.life, thewhiterose.life, and join us as an ally of the White Rose Resistance at $35 a month. Get your battle box, join our digital community, or air support at $70 a month. Get all the same, but join our book club as we read books together, and you hang out live with me on Zoom, and we talk about why these books are important to the formation of the Western civilization, the Christian mind in America, and what we've got to do to wake up. And host a screening of the 1916 Project at your church by going to the 1916project.com. You can also order the book there at that website and get the hardcover so you can get the fold-out timeline of how the kooky, weirdo, eugenicist, neo-Malthusian reduction populations of the 20th century created our culture of death today. The 1916project.com and the whiterose.life. Thank you guys for tuning into The Seth Gruber Show. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is The Seth Gruber Show.